I just want to draw your attention as we're continuing in our series called Sacred and Scattered. Um, I want to draw your attention to something that we just uh, read a few moments ago. Welcome to everybody who's joining us online, live this morning. Uh, so glad that you are here. And uh, I think we're in part five of our series, and we continue towards Advent that is just around the corner. Praise the Lord. Um, but I just want to show you a couple of verses as we go through. Hopefully my clicker is working. Okay. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or take or sit in the company of mockers, Um, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. You see, if if we were going to look at this verse, it says, whatever they do prospers. Some version says it's successful. Because I was going to present uh, a, a kind of a management or an executive seminar this morning and talk about what being successful means to you, I think that we would get a lot of different answers. What is success? Our world is incredibly motivated by being successful. And then that's not peculiar to our culture. That has always been the way that we want to be successful. And you might say, if we were going to be uh, objective, what does that success look like? We actually would probably say, well, maybe it looks like the Canadian dream or the American dream, that you work hard in order to achieve success, whether it be uh, more money or, or you know, just that influence and power and prosperity in the classic sense of the word. If I think about Kelowna and in our part of the world, I'd be a little bit more drilled down. I would say Kelowna's American dream or Canadian dream um, is, is a little bit more nuanced than that. Yes, money is important for sure. Possessions are important. But Kelowna is actually motivated, in my humble opinion, I've been a resident here now since uh, 2008. Um, I would say Kelowna's definition of success surrounds words like comfort leisure, um, freedom. These people come to Kelowna in order to experience the four-season playground that we have. People are getting very, very excited about the hill starting to become more like a ski hill. And and people come to Kelowna to enjoy the lake, to enjoy the hill. We deserve what Kelowna brings to us. That's what success looks like for you to enjoy the comfort and the leisure and the freedom that Kelowna brings. If I was to go on in my seminar and ask, well, how do we get that? How do we get that success? How do we become prosperous? Then these kind of uh, thoughts might come along. Things like, well, you need to be intelligent, whether that be emotional intelligence, social intelligence, intellectual intelligence. You need to work hard. You know, if you work hard, then anything is possible. Then maybe success is connected to talent. Maybe it's connected to just Good luck being in the right place at the right time. Maybe it's connected to taking risks in business or in life in overall. Maybe it's connected to your looks, especially in our culture. Looks are very, very important. Maybe, and there's been studies to show this, that if you're a little bit taller than other people, you tend to be more successful. They actually did a study that showed that if you are six foot or above, then they can actually quantify the amount of money each year more that you will get paid if you are over six foot, which actually is not peculiar to our time frame. It's interesting. You look as far back as William Wallace in the uh, the 12th, 13th century, uh, Braveheart, then the reason they say that he was particularly uh, uh, influential as a leader was that he was much taller than everybody else, and he was able to wield a broadsword really effectively. So height, bizarrely, is connected to success. Maybe, unfortunately, stepping on or over others is a reason and a way towards success. These are all, or a combination of all these things, the things that our culture would say, if you line up these things, you will be successful. But when I think about success, the scripture that we reference at the bottom of our title page about the ancient paths and rest for your soul, that you follow the ancient paths, you find rest for your soul. I feel like if you start looking at success as a framework of rest for your soul, then you're getting closer to what the ancients and really for millennia, people have believed true success actually is. So I want to ask three questions this morning. 
What if success is fundamentally opposed to what we have been led to believe? All that I've just shared, the last five minutes, about what we are led to believe success is, freedom, comfort, leisure, money, influence, position, power, all these things that we as a culture would say are successful. What if that's just a new way of thinking? What if actually up until about 75 years ago, that wasn't the common definition of what success was? Money has always been part of it, but what if money is just actually an an offshoot of what true success really is, byproduct, if you like. Is it possible to be successful in our culture without being particularly intelligent? Is it possible to be successful without working hard to the point where you're sacrificing your family? Is it possible to be successful without overt talent in a particular area, without good luck? without taking massive business risks? Is it possible to be intelligent without being the best-looking spoon in the drawer? Is it possible to be successful without being high? Uh, High. (laughs) That's a fraudulent slip. Is it possible to be successful without height and being tall? Just add it to the log of the many, many things I've said in the pulpit that I, you know, I always get the, uh, the uh, people making comments about my sermon when I make mistakes like that, so bring it on. Is it possible that success actually is fundamentally opposed to everything that we think in our arrogant, can I say, narrow-minded viewpoint of how life should be led? What if Jim Carrey was right? I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that it is not the answer. Um, History, the ancients, and even not the ancients, just people that have gone before us, would say that success is not the American or Canadian dream. They have a completely different definition of success. Um, One of my favorite stories that's come out over the last few years is uh, an event that happened a few years ago on the Kennet and Avon Canal. The canal, uh, this particular canal, some of you have done canal holidays, Um, this this particular canal is 140 kilometers long, and um, this uh, this is what the canal looks like. It's beautiful. And you can get on one of these barges or boats or canal boats, and you can spend, you can go on holidays. We actually considered, Sarah, it's our 30th anniversary next year, and I'm 50 next year, so we thought, well, let's combine it together, and we'll go on a canal holiday until Sarah figured out, actually, no, I don't want to do that. I had this dream of just going along, puttering along at three or four miles an hour, going from pub to pub to eat. And I just thought, this is going to be perfect. Sarah had a completely different dream and decided, no, no, she didn't. We talked about it, to be fair. We did talk about it. She thought it would be really stressful. So one particular uh, gentleman was going down the uh, Kennet and Avon Canal. And unfortunately, when you go along these canals, you are met with a series of what they're called locks. And locks are large mechanisms. They actually have, this is why Sarah got stressed about the idea of being on a canal. You have to jump out. You've done this, haven't you, Clean with Brad? You have to jump out and you actually have to go and close the lock so the water, because you're at different levels in the canal, the water fills up so then you can move down a section and carry on. But it's really, really important important to close these locks, otherwise the canal will actually drain. Just like this gentleman did a few years ago. He forgot to change, to make all the locks, you can just see one in the distance there, 18 of them. He didn't close them properly. Now I'm sure he got to the end of his destination thinking He was successful in going down that canal. We have a different perspective because this is what it should look like. This is what it ended up looking like. He might, from his position, go, hey, I got to where I wanted to go. I was successful. Our perspective is, yeah, dude, you were successful, but look at the chaos you left in your wake, or lack of wake, I should say. We have a completely different perspective. See, success is not about the end of where you get there. In fact, a definition of success is success is the continual realization of a worthy ideal. So, you were unsuccessful. What I love about this story, perhaps the most, is the statement that the, uh, that the organization who looks after this canal, they actually managed to fill up again, 
Uh, the statement they produced, I love the passive aggressive British nature of this statement. It's fantastic. This is the statement. We are a charity, feel the passive aggression. We are a charity, and so we're politely asking boaters to help out by double checking everything's closed up properly when they've finished. It's kind of polite, but also kind of like, we're a charity, this costs us money, and so we're politely asking, I just thought that was fantastic. This guy was not wise in the way he navigated the canal created a wake of destruction behind him. What happens if success is not actually connected with outcome? Because my hope for us as a church is we don't get to the end of our life. My hope for you is that you don't get to the end of your life thinking that you've been successful, whereas actually you've left a wake of lack of success because of the unwise decisions you have made. Because if you read in Joshua 1 verse 8, it says this, Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Literally, this word successful in the Hebrew means to be wise. You see, the ancients connected success and prosperity with wisdom. Not with money and influence and power and position and good looks and everything else that we say, the Canadian dream. They connected success with living life well, being a human well. Woven all through the scriptures, especially in Proverbs and Psalms, you will read things like this. The wise will prosper, the foolish will not so to the ancient Hebrew people, success meant having the wisdom to know how to live well, which is why Solomon, when given the choice of being able to be given anything he wanted by God, he asked for wisdom because that was true success and prosperity. It means you can navigate the canal of your life wisely, knowing that you're doing so successfully because you are being wise. And true wisdom as a Christian, we would say, is found in Jesus, in God. If you actually read the scripture, read the book of the law, read the scriptures and the way that Jesus refers back to the scriptures, you will see all the way through, if you do and follow and get yourself in alignment with what God's best is for you, then truly you will be successful, regardless of whether you have the looks, the height, the good looks, uh, the, the good luck the risk-taking, if you focus on God and what God's best for you is, you will truly be successful because you will be wise. And just as an aside, I do want to address quickly the, this, the prosperity gospel, that prosperous Christians do not look like the prosperity gospel preachers you might have seen on TV that make us really uncomfortable. It's not a Lear jet, fancy cars, fancy houses, and a partner that looks like they've been through a wind tunnel continually with big hair and everything. Everything we kind of go, oh no, that is not prosperity when it comes to Christianity. If you want to picture prosperity, picture Jesus. A successful life. Oh, I've missed this. Uh, there you go. A successful life means to transform our thinking and define success and prosperity around what it means to follow Jesus. It means that a life lived well where we thrive and we flourish as a human being under God's rule. A life lived well right in the middle of pain and suffering. A life lived well when it comes in connection to our relationships and in the middle of our, our crazy culture. A life lived well as we navigate our consumer focused, materialistic world. That's what successful means. And parents, that's what it means to teach your children to thrive. Your number one focus as a parent is to make sure you can do everything you can to position your child so that they can thrive, so that they can prosper just as your soul prospers in every way, not just financially, but every way knowing how to be human well. So if the first question is what is success is fundamentally opposed to what we have been led to believe, it means that we have to start thinking differently about what success is. And that changes the way we view other things around us, especially in Kelowna, because there's this insidious pull towards what our culture would say is important that takes us down a path where we end up like the canal I've just shown you. 
So if success means to be wise, to live well, to live like Jesus, to respond like Jesus, the next question is pretty obvious. What if how to be successful is a revolutionary yet time-tested formula, we need to be careful with this word, I'll come back to it, modeled to us by millennia of people before us. What am I saying there? If success looks different, and we I think innately know it is, then how do we get to be successful? And is there something that we've been shown by people that have gone before us that seems to be like a formula, a plan, if you like, principles, if you prefer, that if we follow these principles, then we do become successful, that we do prosper in the true sense of the word? What is that? How do we become successful? Well, the Bible tells us really, really clearly. Look at this. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way of sinners, take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his Lord day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water. So we're starting to see clues as to how we truly become successful and prosperous in a culture that is trying to push us towards the wrong definition of success and prosperity. To be truly successful and prosperous means to align ourselves with God. How do we do that? We're starting to see delight and meditation on the Bible, on scriptures. Keep this book, says Joshua. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. You see why I was, and I thought about whether or not to use the word formula, but this seems formulaic. If you do this, then you will get this. This is a promise from the Lord. If you meditate on the book of the law, and and the book of the law in Joshua's time was the first five books of the Bible, but then as far as Christianity and Jesus referring to the whole of Scripture, so that would be the prophets and the poets and and everything that is in the, and the, um, and all of the Old Testament, and there's references in the New Testament to the new writing within the New Testament as well. So the whole of the Bible, as we meditate on it, as we delight on it, then we will be prosperous and successful. When I think about the Bible, and I've got a pretty new Bible here, it's still quite shiny, I have this uh, as, a, as a present. Um, when I think about the Bible, and when I first became fascinated with the Bible, I was about 17 years old, and I'd had a, a radical transformational experience with God, and my mom and dad probably remember it well, and I know Sarah does, because it really was a, a, a completely different person then and after. I got absolutely fascinated with the scriptures. And that was at a time when there wasn't the internet. And so all I had was the Bible and whatever books that my dad happened to have on the bookshelf. And so what I did is I thought, well, I'm going to start reading this thing like a book. And I didn't have any guidance. There was no Bible reading plans. There was nobody who had really come up with anything that I'd really heard of at that time. And, uh, and so I just started reading it. And I got fascinated with it. I loved it. I loved spending time with it. And it was just a delight. But then, over time, and I have to confess this, even as a pastor, and I haven't always been a pastor, but even as a pastor, I find that there's that that initial delight that was experiential, and I felt like God was infusing my life as I was reading it. It started to wane. And it was a natural thing in one sense because I started looking at the Bible. I felt called to preach. And so as an 18, 19-year-old, I started preaching and started going down that line of being apprenticed in that. I started looking at the Bible in a different way. It became now a, a place where I could find my next sermon. And I started being introduced to commentaries and Matthew Henry especially. And, and so I started dissecting it. And slowly and surely, if I'm being really honest, and and I confess this to you, over the years, I have to be really careful that I don't look at this more as a textbook than I do actually what it's meant to be. It holds up to scrutiny the scriptures. 
And I don't just say that because I'm a pastor, but you can now go on the internet and you can see people who are far, far smarter than I am who have approached the Bible from a very skeptical point of view to try and dissect it and show that it's, that it's nonsense and doesn't work and then come through that process becoming Christians, which I love. It holds up to scrutiny. So if you are going to approach it as a textbook, you'll find that it's a very sound, perfect textbook. But that's not what it's designed to to be. What was once alive, what once I craved, I now started to approach as a textbook. And if we're really honest, many of us approach the scriptures like this. That we, 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 we look at it with heavy hearts, something we have to do. Something that, well, I'm a Christian and my pastor tells me I should read my Bible, so I'm going to read my Bible. And maybe we kind of relegate it to a few moments a day. Maybe we grab it on our iPhones. Maybe we listen to it. We don't actually spend time in it. And, and it just feels like there's a sigh connected to the Bible rather than what it was really, really meant to be. Let's, let's get it done. We approach it like a textbook that needs to be mastered as quickly as possible place where, like other textbooks or other books you might read, that you just want to gain information, you want to find guidance, you want to solve a problem, that maybe very dangerously you want to go to the Bible to prove a point that you have. This is how I think, so therefore I'm going to go to the Scriptures, and oh, lo and behold, I found something that proves my point of view, so therefore I will believe in God after all, because I'm only going to believe in a God who agrees with me. Maybe you go to the scripture to find guidance about something really specific in your life and you're left wanting because you know, no matter how hard you look, there aren't certain things in here that you're going to find guidance on. Maybe you go to the Bible for a shot in the arm, answers to particular questions. Maybe you go to the Bible and proof text. Proof texting is where, again, you go with a certain viewpoint. You find a verse that seems to prove your, proof po- your, your point of view, and there's another one, and there's another one, not looking at the scriptures in context or anything like that, or prayerfully. You just come out the other end having proof text your way through to agreeing with what you already thought in the first place. Is that really what the scriptures is all about? I love this quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. The word of scripture... The top of it is is missing, so let me read it to you. The word of Scripture should never stop sounding in your ears and working in you all day long, just like the words of someone whom you love. And just as you do not analyze the words of someone you love, but accept them as they are said to you, accept the word of Scripture and ponder it in your heart as Mary did. That is all. Do not ask, how shall I pass this one, or what does it say to me? Then ponder this word long in your heart until it has gone right into you and taken possession of you. So friends, I want to I suggest to you that perhaps the way that you are approaching Scripture, if it feels lifeless or boring or just obligatory and something you've got to do because that's what Pastor Glenn says you should do, if that is the way that you're approaching Scripture and that is what the Bible has become to you, just something that you're grinding your way through, your Bible reading plan out of sheer discipline, if that is where you're at, I want to suggest to you that today's topic that I want to introduce you to in just a second will completely revolutionize not on your Bible reading, but your whole Christian life. It will bring the Bible back to where it was actually meant to be. Um, when, uh, when Sarah and I were courting, when we were going out, this is pre, uh, pre-internet, pre-texting, pre-Snapchat, you know, pre-everything it feels like. You know, when mum and dad still locked the phone, so you you couldn't spend ages on the phone because in Britain you had to actually pay for your phone calls, and so we had a little lock on it. You had to get the key, and mainly for my sister, if I'm honest. Um, It was hard to communicate, so you used to you used to write letters to one another, and. And and I remember one particular time I went away for a summer. I was working at a camp, and so I was gone for six weeks. I think we were engaged at the time. And we had this every other day. uh, We received a letter from one another. And Sarah's, we've still got all those letters. And one of the things that you used to do in those times, and I was kind of intrigued to see whether this was something that was British um, or whether some of you will know what this means, is, um, is this. 
Does anyone know what? This isn't one of Sarah's letters, and I certainly wasn't wearing lipstick sending it to her. Does anybody know, just by show of hands, know what, what this word means? Okay, those of you who don't, just have a look around. Keep your hands up. Okay, what this means is sealed with a loving kiss. So, <laughs> Janet's like, I've received everything I need. I can go home now. <laughs> sealed with a loving kiss. It actually comes from World War II, where soldiers used to send letters home, and there'd be these letters going back and forth, and so this is an actual, this is, this is sealed with a kiss, but that's where it comes from, from World War II. So then I did some more research, and it was a whole code system, Holland, this was hope our love lives, lasts, and never dies. Isn't that amazing? Radio, uh, romance and delight I offer. Italy, I trust and love you. Belfast, be ever loving, faithful, and stay true. So these were things that they put on the letters. The thing with a love letter is you don't read it like you read a web page. Because if you're anything like me, I skim a web, a web page, I just get the bits that I need out of it, and then I walk away. I'm not in anticipation of what this web page might say to the point that I was in anticipation of receiving a letter from Sarah. That I used to actually go and look forward to getting the letter because it was a letter from my loved one. The person who actually meant everything to me in the world at that time. I wanted to know her thoughts. There was an anticipation to it. That this special person was sharing and expressing her feelings for me. I savored every word and I worry that I don't actually lie at wake, lie awake at night worrying, but you'll understand. I kind of it, it bothers me that this whole culture misses out on this. This sense of anticipation and savoring over the words and keeping the letters for the future, ponder, pondering over what these things might mean as I read them, the the emotions that I feel, the, all these things, all wrapped up in just receiving a love letter. This might make you uncomfortable, but if it does, it proves my point. We have to look at the Bible as a love letter from God. We need to savor it. We need to ponder it. We need to anticipate what it might say to us. That we actually think about the emotions that we feel as we read it. Does our soul crave after God to the same extent that our lives crave after the one that we truly love. That we have this opportunity to crawl into God's mind and thoughts and heart and be transformed as a result. And if we only approach the Bible as a textbook, as a place to get direction, as a kind of a rote, oh, uh, I'm obligated to do this, then we are missing out. How awful would it be if I had approached the letters that Sarah had sent me with that same viewpoint, Rather than approaching them with the, what is Sarah going to say to me, my loved one, the one that I want to be close to, the one that is expressing her thoughts and feelings to me, am I going to ponder them? Do I crave after this letter? Because when you are distant, you crave after these letters. And God in his wisdom has compiled these thoughts and put them into one place. And there's something about this book that, yes, you can approach it like a textbook, a history book, a poet book, a book of history. Whatever you want to do, sure, you can do that. And it's fascinating to read it that way. But God's intent was that this was his love letter. And some of you are uncomfortable with me saying that. I can feel it. Because you don't like to see God as somebody who is passionate after you, but he is. So passionate, he sent his son for you. And his son was passionate about the scriptures. That his thoughts can inhabit our thoughts. That his actions can inhabit our actions. That we come face to face with ourselves as we read the scriptures. I love what Keller says, where the, when you, you don't read it, it reads you. 
that our emotions and our curiosity, our imagination, our will is shaped by God's communicated love to us as we meditate on the scriptures. Because look, it says, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night. Because when you're anticipating a love letter, you think about it regularly. So much deeper than a text. And this is what, this is what I think one of the downsides of technology is it takes away the joy of enjoying reading. then you will be prosperous and successful. This word meditation is a very emotive word in our culture, especially Christian culture, and because it's been been kind of hijacked, if you like, by Hinduism and and Buddhism, and so we immediately think of meditation as something that's quite negative, and yet if you look at the difference between Hebrew and Eastern meditation, there are massive, massive differences. See, Eastern meditation talks about emptying your mind and looking to yourself. Whereas Hebrew, Christian meditation, is about filling your mind with the word of God and looking to God and his thoughts. It's completely different. And in that moment when you approach the scriptures in that way, the promise is that just as, uh, as God said, that he actually will saturate your life through meditating on the scriptures. Not just reading them, but meditating on them. This word meditate um, in, in the Hebrew that we read in, in Joshua 1a, as you meditate on the law of God, it means to think deeply, to chew on. One of the favorite members of our family is our dog, Maggie. And Maggie generally is a pretty, uh, pretty laid-back individual, except if you're new and she's not sure about you. She gets pretty anxious around that. But if you give her certain treats, especially a real bone from T-bones or something like that, then we've noticed that she doesn't do it with me, because I think she, and, or Sarah, I think she sees us as alpha in the family. But with other people, then if you go and try and take that bone off her, she'll growl. And she'll snarl a little bit. It's kind of like, whoa, you know, and we've tried to kind of get her to change, but it's just something in her. She growls over it. That's what this word meditate means to actually growl over it, to chew over it. That's why Isaiah's picture of a lion in, in reference to this, like growling over it. She takes hours over her bone, and it's the same picture that we should be chewing over, growling over it, kind of playing with it and chewing on it and ingesting it. That's what it means to meditate on the scriptures. So a quick verse or two in the middle of a devotion is just not going to get there. It's to sit and dwell in it, chew on it, digest it, get life from it, get nourishment, get strength from it. You don't just read it, it reads you. So, what if success is different from what we've been led to believe? What if how we become successful is different from how we've been taught? That it's actually based on meditation, and in that meditation is transformation. So really, to pull all this together as one of our practices of being the sacred and the scattered, how do we, how do we actually do this meditation? How do we approach the Word of God? Very famous um, uh, uh, quote now, thanks to the work John Mark Comer has done and, and his book, this quote from Dallas Willard that rushing is the great enemy of the spiritual life. If you approach this book in a rush, just got to get through it, just got to get my word for the day. And there's a place for Bible reading plans. I'm actually a great believer in Bible reading plans. I think you should read the Bible through each year. I think that's wonderful to get it all in its context and picture. But there's also an added element. We need to slow down. We need to slow down and we need to seek the thin place. If you don't know what I'm referring to, then please listen to last week's sermon. That that place where it feels like the air between you and God gets thin. We need to find that thin place as we read the scripture. And one of the ancient practices, and we've been talking a lot about ancient practices. Why? Because we can look back over millennia and millions, billions of people who have placed certain habits and practices in their life that have drawn them closer to God. And we can look back across this millennia and we can say, okay, what is it that they learned that we can put in our lives today? And one of those practices, and you may have heard this, is Lectio Divina, which literally means spiritual reading. I've already given our disclaimers a few weeks ago that there are certain words that might be very emotive to you, that this sounds like, or this sounds dodgy. It's just Latin. 
I actually did Latin for a few years at school. Don't remember any of it, apart from Carpe Diem, and that was because of Dead Poets Society and nothing to do with Father McCarthy at my school. Um, but it means spiritual reading. It's this balance between silence and solitude, last week, and reading. It's like having a conversation with God where you read and you listen. So I'm not, just gonna, I'm not just going to have a conversation with Sarah where it's one-sided. That's not a conversation, that's just listening. There's, there's, there, there's, a, there's a moment where you savor what God is saying to you. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through. Uh, there, there's, there's some question over whether there's five or six sections. They actually call it movements because the idea is there's a rhythm to it. It's not like section one, complete, section two, complete. That's not how you do it. It's like a, you move from one thing to the next. It's not a, a structured thing. It could be you bouncing back and forth between them. And so there's some question over there, six. I think there's for sure four. Five. The first one is this, you, you find, first of all, silencio, you ready yourself, you quieten yourself. This is the first part of Lectio Divino, that you actually sit in silence. You switch things off, you clear your heart and your mind of distractions, you maybe do some breathing, you're not emptying your mind, you just trying to, like we did with the, when we talked about last week, the daily X-Men, you're, you're, you're just kind of, okay, Lord, this is your moment. You ask God to speak to you as you start to read. You choose a small passage. It can be any passage at all, maybe from the Psalms or New Testament. It might be a parable or something that Jesus did in one of the Gospels or a section in the letters from Paul. It really doesn't matter. A smaller, maybe four to six verses, and you just start reading. You just read. Some people find it helpful to read out loud. Might be as a little bit of a whisper. There's some science behind that because your, your mind, your ears hearing your words is a kind of a double imprint psychologically. And so if you just, when you read something out loud, it immediately brings a focus to your attention. So just read it slowly. Four or five times helps. And then start attuning yourself to what it might be that God is saying in that passage. I highlight my Bible. I'm quite, uh, um, I'm a little bit OCD about my highlighting. I need to be a certain pen, and I do it in a certain way, and there's a little code that I understand that nobody else would. But imagine that the Lord just suddenly highlights something for you, that spiritually something resonates. There might be a word, it might be a sentence, it might be an action of someone, it could be something Jesus did. Something that makes you go, huh, I wonder what's there. And don't skip past that. Take note of it. Take, okay, that could be it. That could be what you chew on, growl over, meditate on. You just pause, and you read, and then you move back into silence. Just enjoy the moment. Then you meditate. You reflect on it. Lord, what are you saying to me? What does this mean for me and my life? Some people journal, and that's okay, but I would encourage you, before you get to journaling, because journaling can be a distraction. Before you know it, you, you're thinking about other things. But just, just meditate in the moment. What is it, Lord, that you are saying to me? I feel like you've highlighted this to me. And at first you might say, you might think, I don't know what this has got to do with anything. Stay with it. Let's assume what we say we believe is actually true, that God speaks to us, that the Word of God speaks to us. Lord, what are you saying to me? Chew on it for a little while. And by the way, this does not take hours. This could just be a few minutes. It can take an hour if you want it to, because the longer you take, the more you chew on it, the more you chew on it. It's like the more the Lord reveals. And then you respond, ratio. You pray. You talk to God about it. You engage with him. Maybe you're prompted to start worshiping. Maybe it's just this point of confession. Maybe it's gratitude. Perhaps you pray for something specific that seems to connect with what you've just been meditating on for those few minutes. Maybe you're really frustrated and angry about something and you just want to rail at God. That's okay. Maybe you want to shake a fist at him because your world right now feels like it's caving in. Can I tell you that God, all through the scriptures, responds so beautifully to people in their passion and their hurt. Read the Psalms. It's 
filled with David going, what is going on? God, where are you? That's okay. Have that moment where you respond and you talk, you pray it back to God. This is praying through scripture. That's what Lectio Defino is. It's, it's praying out the scripture and then contemplatio, you rest. You just sit in it. You've done your praying. You just sit there. Maybe you just quiet on yourself. God, is there anything else you want to say? Savor it. Just savor it. You know when you, you have this amazing meal and you, you've chewed on it and then you swallow it down and there's just this moment of, oh my goodness, that was so good. I can't wait for the next mouthful. That's the savoring picture. You're just like, thank you, Lord. And the sixth one, where there's some question as to whether or not, because all this happens in the thin place, if you like. This can happen in the daily examen. This can happen in your devotions. Some of you might go, I've done this for years. And that's wonderful. You never use the title Lecture Divino. That's okay. But once this has happened, there's a sixth one, some would say, which is incarnatio, which is that you resolve to take this into the world with you. You say, right, in the light of what I have just heard from the Lord, this is what my day is going to look like. This is what I resolve to do. And maybe that's when you pray, Lord, help me to live this out today. Savor that moment and then go and live it out. You and God in the thin place. This should be the best moment of the day because it's you and the divine, he that breathed the universe into being, he that hung on the cross so that all the sin and shame and the evil that we're attacked with could die with him on the cross. And in newness of life, we can live with him, so we can have communion with him like this. It's a gift. Can you see, approaching the word of God like this will result in real life transformation. It's a love letter. God wants to speak to you. He wants you to savor it. He wants you to enjoy it. And so... As we consider this, as we finish, that person, the one who meditates, is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do will prosper. Those moments every day. I want to encourage you this week. Last week I said to spend some time doing the, um, they all began with R as well, pure coincidence. Um, Spending time with the Lord using the daily examen or examen, however you want to say it. And, and if you're not sure what that is, it's on social media. Jenny put it on Instagram. You can see it all there. Listen to last week's message. I want to just slot in something else for you to do in your own practice every day, which is to savor the word of the Lord. It will be something that is revolutionary to you if you are not doing it. Because whatever you do, the promise of the Lord will prosper. We need people in our world who are truly prospering in the truest, most biblical sense of the word. And so as we think about the daily process, the X-Men, we've, we've rejoiced, we've refocused, we've reviewed. I just want us to spend a couple of minutes just, maybe Sarah, you could play, well actually no, you know what, we'll just do it in silence. And then the worship team will come up because I don't want to distract us. But we're just going to be silent and just ask the Lord. Maybe close your eyes right now. We're going to ask the Lord, is there anything that we need to repent of? That maybe in the light of what I have said, maybe something else that the Lord has just revealed to you. Quietly just confess that. Ask for his forgiveness. Know that Jesus on the cross is that purest, purest sign that for those who believe that he is Lord and confess that with his mouth or her mouth that they will be saved. Thank you, Lord. Lord, as we come to the end of our time together, Lord, I pray that 
that this word, this letter from you to us will not be peripheral to our lives, but Lord, that truly we will savor, meditate, and chew, and savor it. Lord, I pray that we would be a church, a church family of people who truly listen. And that, Lord, that we would, our lives would be marked by true prosperity and success that comes as a result of our practices with you. Hallelujah, Lord. We're so grateful. Jesus, we're so grateful for your death and your resurrection. And Lord, as we stand with so many people that have gone before us, who worship and praise you on a Sunday, just like us, who say words just like us, the Lord, as we stand with all those people, Lord, I pray that you would truly be glorified in our lives. You are holy. You are worthy. And you are so kind and good to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.